All right, follow me quickly to the book of Colossians chapter 3. We're following, we're, we're reading it out of the NLT. Now, now we study in the ESV, but we read it on Sundays through the NLT because it's a little easier to process big sections of scripture. And this opening passage is from the Apostle Paul, his letter to this church in Colossae, um, where he was, uh, and he wrote it when he was in chains, when he was a prisoner in Rome around 60 AD. So this is just a few years after he wrote to the Corinthians this letter we've been studying. So we're going to be starting in verse, cha- uh, verse 12 in chapter 3. And pay attention to his tone um, as someone who is a prisoner, someone in chains, someone in jail. This is his tone. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its riches Fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And this is it right here. And whatever you do and whatever you say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And again, listen, this is Paul this, this famous apostle writing from jail, being wrongfully sentenced, saying, first and foremost, love one another. Love one another. Be known for mercy and kindness, humility and patience. Let the peace that only comes from Christ rule your hearts. And verse 15, 6, 17, and whatever you do, or whatever you say, whether you're free or in chains, whether you're a soldier or a student, do it all as representatives of the Lord. Do it all as representatives of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray as we get started. God, open our eyes and our ears to what it is you have from us for us today. God, soften our hearts because we want to hear from you. God, we believe that you are real and you are present with us, God. God, help us be in tune with what it is you have. It's in your name that we pray. And we all said, amen. Amen. Well, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name is David. Thank you, Pastor Joe, for leading us earlier. Um, I'm the site pastor here at New City. And man, I'm glad you made it to church. It's a good day to be at church. Um, I really believe God has a message for you today. Um, God has a message to lead you in a better way this morning. And I I know um, that some of you might have had a tough week. I don't know all the stuff that you brought in with you today. Um, Maybe today or even past couple days have been harder than you would have preferred, but I just want to encourage you that you've taken that first step today of being here. You could have slept in. You could have gone to brunch. You could have made all sorts of excuses for why not to be here, but you're here, and that's the first step. So now that you're here, the encouragement for you is be present here. And don't waste this moment because God wants to meet you here. God wants to speak to you, and he wants to lead you into a life that he has set aside. So before we dig in, I just want to pause and just center, take a breath, do your best in this moment to just strip back some of those layers of life that you carried in, and just say, God, speak, I'm listening. God, speak. I'm listening. We are here today, God, to hear from you. We are here to receive from you this morning. This isn't out of obligation or loyalty. God, this is out of relationship. God, speak. We're listening. Well, if you're just joining us, we are in week two of a mini-series called I Surrender All. And this series fits 
within the bigger study we've been doing of the book of 1 Corinthians. And, and in this series, we're taking a closer look at some of the firm encouragement Paul had for his friends living in Corinth, um, and really the encouragement he has for us, um, where our priorities and where our motivations must lie as followers of Jesus. And so in chapter 8, as we started last week, we learned about these educated, proud Corinthians um, that now knew the truth about Jesus. They were once they were once lost, but now they are found. And, and so now that they're found, they're living out some of this new freedom that they had as followers of Jesus. But the problem came in, in chapter 8, um, in that when they were exercising their freedoms that they now had, they began to lead their weaker or less mature brothers back to a life of sin. And the passage we read was all about food, if anyone remembers. See, the mature believers, knowing that there was only one true God, um, they would regularly go to the temple and buy meat that was sacrificed to idols in pagan temples, okay? And then when the other people in the church saw this, folks that might have had a deeper history with the temple or maybe they had just re recently gotten saved, um, when they saw the church going to the temple and buying food sacrificed to a foreign god or a pagan god or a false idol, um, this action led some of the weaker believers into like, their old life. It brought them back into old patterns and old ways. And so Paul was writing them saying, okay, yeah, you are free. Yeah, it's just meat. But you are only as free as loving your neighbor permits. You are only as free as love permits. And just because God gives you permission in theory, practically, if you live out those freedoms and it causes your brother to sin, then you are in turn sinning against Jesus. So don't do it. It's not, it's not worth it. Your neighbor's spiritual life and direction is far more important. It's far more important than your ability to buy cheap meat. So it's this message, this theme that transitions into chapter 9. Um, and that's where we're going to pick up today. So if you have your Bibles, chapter 9. And for the sake of time, we're actually going to pick up in verse 19. Um, because there's a lot to this chapter, but let me give you a quick summary of what comes before. So as we turn the page from chapter 8 to chapter 9, starting in verse 1, after spending all that time talking about surrendering freedom to love, Paul starts to talk about his own freedom. He starts to talk about his own rights, because there were folks in the church at the time that were kind of like, uh, why should I care about what Paul has to say? Why is Paul such a big deal? And so Paul, verse 1, is like, hey, am I not free as everyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus, our Lord, with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you even belong to the Lord? And even if others think I'm not an apostle, an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. And as an apostle, Paul's like, and as an apostle, as one who is seeing God, there are certain rights that are promised to me. There are certain things I deserve. Um, I deserve to get paid, Paul's like. I deserve to get paid. I deserve respect, and I have the right to food and shelter from anyone in the church. Because honestly, without me, you wouldn't even know the Lord. So shouldn't I have an even greater right to support from you, he says. And, the, and he was asking all these rhetorical questions because the obvious answer was totally yes, Paul, the apostle, is absolutely deserving of honor and respect and support from the church. Of course he has a right to it. But then we hear him say something a little funny in verse 12. Because after spending all this time, right, supporting his rights, he goes, um, but I have never used this right. And I'm not writing to suggest that I start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. And now, on first pass, this is all very confusing. Because for 10 verses, Paul is saying, I am important. Recognize who I am. But I willingly choose not to be supported, even to the point of death, so I can continue to preach without charge. And, and why would he ever say this? after going on and on and on proving himself. Well, it all comes back to priority and the priority that Paul placed on the gospel. Let me explain. First century, we talk about this a lot because we need to know 
what was happening. In the first century, much like today, there were often these people that would come into the towns, okay, um, selling all sorts of cures or promise for prosperity, and they would show up and hold these big old rallies, okay? And, and they would try to convince listeners that they knew the true solution or the true source of happiness and wealth and health and, and, and whatever. So these, these folks would come in, but this counsel they offered, this truth that they had, it came at a price. And this was life, right? And so if you wanted truth, it's available to you. I got it. I'll give it to you, but it's going to cost you. And so this reality in Corinth, though common, it came with this instant sense of skepticism. Kind of like those late night infomercials were like, for five easy payments of $29.99, you know? And this is why we saw the re- see the response from Paul in, in verse 12, where he's like, even though I deserve to get paid, I would rather die than charge for truth because I don't want anything. I don't want anything to be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. I don't want anything in me or on me, anything I do or deserve to create a barrier between Jesus and the world. And this is the priority that Paul placed on the gospel. He says, whatever I can do, if there's anything I can do to remove any type of skepticism you might have about Jesus, Let me know, and I do it. Count me in, anything. And we see this priority supported in our passage starting in verse 19. It's gonna be on the screen as well, where he says, he says, even though, even though I'm a free man with no master, with all rights as an apostle and as a Roman citizen, even though I am free, I have become a servant to all people, to bring many to Christ. Verse 20, so when I was with the Jews, I would live like a Jew. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I am not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring Christ those who are under the law. Verse 21, when I'm with the Gentiles who do not know the Jewish law, I I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ. But I don't ignore the law of God. Oh, I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. You see a pattern here. Yes, Paul says, I try to find common ground with everyone. Another translation says, I have become all things to all people. Try to find common ground. Doing everything I can to save Some, I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Don't you realize? Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. And so Paul's like, run to win. Run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win the prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might disqualify, be disqualified. Verse 19, one more time. So even though I am a free man, even though I have freedom and rights, I have become a servant to all people to bring many to Christ. It's a big passage. A lot to take in. So what is it that we learned? Three things I want to point out, um, and I'm sure that there's more that pop up to you, um, but here's what really stood out. Number one, first, for Paul, the good news or the gospel of Jesus is all that matters. It's all that matters, even to the point of death. He would rather die than create any obstacle in its delivery to the world. Paul said he would happily become a servant. One translation says a slave to all people for the opportunity of reaching just a few. Let that sink in for just a second. This is Paul. Happily become a servant to all people for the opportunity to reach a few. 
And I think for some of us um, that read a lot of the Bible, like everyone in this room, right? You read a lot of Bible. I think it can be easy for us to get trapped in the words of Paul. Um, like there's somehow a, a graduated lesson from the words of Jesus. Like maybe, so there's a story of Jesus and then Paul like makes it awesome. But that's, that's absolutely not the case. See, for Paul, it was the gospel up here, gospel up here, and then everything else down here, including himself. Gospel, okay? Everything else down here, even good things. And everything he did and said, it was to help share that message and keep it pure. Paul believed that everything existed in submission to the gospel. The gospel is all that matters. And I think, in theory, as the church today, I think most of us, um, we would agree, right? That Jesus is the boss. That, that Jesus wins and the gospel is legit. I think most of us would testify to that to that statement, but, but if you were anything like me most of my life, I didn't really know what I was agreeing to. I'd be like, yeah, man, the gospel is awesome. It's all about the gospel, but if someone then asked me to explain the gospel or share the gospel, I'd be like, uh. And I think a lot of that for me comes back to when I was a kid and I, and I bought into this incomplete sales pitch of what the gospel really was at a Bible camp. And if you haven't seen this picture, actually, this is, this is 12-year-old David. Should be up here somewhere. You got it for me? Yep, okay. 12-year-old Pastor David and Camp Romance Jody Ellis. The center part. I... I always wanted to be that kid from Home Improvement. Does anyone remember Home Improvement? <laughs> JTT, all day long. And so anyway, I, I have this memory of hanging out at this camp, right? And summer camps are awesome. Bible camps are, are awesome. But I have this memory of hanging out with my, my buddy Jed, and we were eating breakfast, and all of a sudden, like, I looked across the, I looked across the lunchroom, and my eyes locked with Jody Ellis. And, and I was like mid-spoonful of generic Fruit Loops because that's what they got, you know, like the generic Fruit Loops. And I knew in that moment that my summer would never be the same because Bible Camp Romance is the best. Anyone ever have a Bible Camp Romance? Zero hands go up. I appreciate that. <laughs> Y'all had a bit, are you, are you a, a result of a Bible Camp Romance? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Anyway, but as it goes, Bible camp eventually comes to an end every, every week, and, and at the end of the week, it was the time that the directors and the pastors, like, really started, like, wanting to seal the deal with these kids, right? And so last night at Bible camp, there's usually this intense, like, emotional presentation of the gospel, and it always starts with this phrase, if you were to die tonight... If you were to die tonight, and, and, and all these kids are like, what? We were just out playing kickball. We got camp romance. You can, I know this is distracting for everyone, so you can take that off the screen. <laughs> all these kids are like, are you kidding me? I'm, I'm not thinking about dying tonight. If I'm going to die tonight, do I know where I'd go? And middle school me, though, like, so guys up front, he's like, if you were to die tonight, do you know? where you go. And middle school me, I was like, heck yeah, I know where I'm going to go. Hanging out with, with, with Jody Ellis. In my brain, I was like, I'm going to heaven. I grew up in the church. I know what this is all about. I'm going to heaven. And so then the guy up front, he starts singing, our God is an awesome God. He you know what I'm saying, right? This is camp. And then he, and then he goes, well, how do you know? How do you know you're going to heaven? And then I'm thinking, man, I don't know. I guess I, guess I just thought I, I, I know. And then the song changes. 
And the guy's like, well, this is the gospel. This is how you know. This is how you know for sure. And, and he starts singing the gospel. He goes, Jesus came from heaven to earth to show the way. Anyone? From the earth to the cross, my dead. We have the motions too, right? From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on. Right? And, and the guy's like, and listen, this is all you need to know. This is it. All you need to do to know for sure is come down front and sing this song with us and pray this prayer and go through those motions and respond to the gospel. And you better believe I was first one down there. Right? <laughs> I was like, I know these motions. I know how to sing this song. And I was down up front singing and praying because I wanted to know. Because I wanted to know for sure that I was saved. And when I died, that I was going somewhere better. And it was a cool moment. I think a lot of us have been in moments like that too. It's one that I remember. But I tell you what, the next day as we packed up and I said God, goodbye to my buddy Jed and Jody, the feeling that I experienced the night before, that feeling, it began to fade because the moment began to fade. But I tell you what, that description, that description of the gospel stuck with me for years. And this is what I always thought the gospel was. And even though the guy had the best of intentions in getting these kids saved, right, and jump-starting our spiritual lives, this presentation of the good news, though true, was a bit incomplete. And it led me, and probably a lot of you in this room, to think that the gospel was really all about me. That the gospel was all about me going to heaven and not going to hell because of a prayer and the motions and the decision I made when I was 12. When really, and you need, to, you need to hear this. I don't care where you're from. I don't, know how, I don't care how long you've been in the church. You need to hear this. The gospel isn't about us at all. The gospel is about Jesus. There are some amazing byproducts of the gospel for us, like heaven. But the message that Paul said he was willing to die for, the message that Paul refused support to present it wasn't just about his afterlife. Now, see, Paul, he saw the bigger picture. And his understanding of the gospel of Jesus, it went a little something like this. Paul would say, in the beginning, God created everything and it was perfect. Then, the prize of creation, Adam and Eve, they brought sin and destruction and chaos into the beauty that was the world. And it caused this relational disconnect between humans and God. And this is really where the gospel starts, right here. Because God wasn't happy with this reality and this disconnect. So even then, in the beginning, he began to make a way for this rift to be repaired. And it all started with a people called Israel. And God had big dreams for them, huge dreams for them. But ultimately, over time, they failed to hold up their end of the deal. And they failed to be the fix that God needed them to be as a people and as a kingdom. And so, and so that's when God had to take matters into his own hands. And this is when God became one of us, named Jesus he came out of Israel, out of God's chosen people, to be the perfect Israel that they could never be. Jesus, this promised Messiah and King, repairing broken relationships between God and the world, repairing through perfect sacrifice. So yes, God did come from heaven to earth to show the way, from the earth to the cross to the grave for three days. It's all true, and it's gospel, but what we miss out on, and what I missed out on when I was 12 and that last night of Bible camp is why this happened in the first place. Like, why did God do this? 
Because my brain always went back to me, right? My brain always went to John 3, 16. Whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life. So Jesus came to give me eternal life. Wrong. Jesus didn't come to give me eternal life. The gospel isn't about me having eternal life. The good news is found in the first part of that verse that I skipped over to make it about myself. John 3, 16, what does it say? For so loved the world that he sent his son. Why did Jesus come? Because God so loved the world. Because God so loves this world, he sent Jesus to fix the mess we made of creation and our relationship to the Father. This is why Jesus came, to take the power back from sin and death that we gave it, to take the power back and to rule as king over a new kingdom, the only king forever, a kingdom that will never fade or fail, and whoever believes in him, right, in Jesus, will have eternal life, no doubt. But more importantly, whoever believes in him, they're now free. They're now free from the power of sin and death to serve at the pleasure of the king. The king, Jesus. And this, friends, is the good news. This is the gospel. Jesus is king both now and forever, and if you're with him, if you're with him, then you are a new creation and a new kingdom for all of eternity. And yeah, I get that this might have been a lot for a 12-year-old David to take in. I get it. But this, friends, this is the message that Paul was willing to die for. It wasn't about him and his personal salvation. It was about Jesus and his saving power. It wasn't about a one-time prayer for the future and some carefully orchestrated emotional moment. No, the gospel is about total and absolute surrender to the gracious, humble, loving King of Kings. And that's why Paul is writing, because listen, in this church in Corinth, they started to treat the gospel this good news as like an afterlife retirement plan. They're like, as long as I believe, I'm okay. As long as I'm okay. As long as, as, long as I believe, I'm okay. But, and to be honest, right, isn't that where most of us have sit most of our life? As long as I believe, I'm okay. Where you have like, you got this faith, like you, you got belief, in Jesus for the future, but you don't necessarily allow the message or command of Jesus to affect your today. I think we've all been there more than we like to admit, but again, if there's one thing I need you to take away this morning, it's that believing in Jesus for heaven without actually following Jesus on earth, it's not enough. And I'm not here with some list of checkboxes, right? I don't got my clipboard to see if you're safe or if you're going to make it in. All I'm saying is Jesus is Savior, but the good news is that Jesus is King. And if you want to be a part of that kingdom, you better act like it. Because faith without works is dead. And yeah, there's grace. Praise the Lord. And there's forgiveness and there's love. But what Paul is getting at, this isn't me. This is the words of Paul. The Apostle Paul is saying that gospel salvation is more than a ticket to heaven. It's obedient submission. Without submission, it's not salvation. I'm going to say it one more time. Without submission, it's not salvation. And that is a bold statement. That is so counterculture, and it causes you, I'm sure, and it causes me to ask myself, am I, am I living in submission to Jesus? Not just for the future, but for today. Because in the end, Jesus and this kingdom and his love for the world, it's all that matters. It's all that matters. The gospel is all that matters, and Paul shows us that 
in this observation number two, and everything else gets going quick from here, okay? Observation number two, when he says that the good news isn't just for perfect people, that the gospel is for everyone. For everyone. Verse 20 says, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew. When I was with the Gentiles, I live like a Gentile. When I'm with the weak, I, I share their weakness because I want to bring everyone to Christ. I try to find common ground, verse 22, with everyone doing everything I can to spread the good news. I try to find common ground with who? Everyone. Not just the people I feel comfortable around. Not just the people who claim the same political affiliation or have it all together, or all the people who claim to be Christians or share my preferences. No, because the gospel is for everybody. For everybody. I surrender all, Paul says, to the point of death or being locked up in prison. I surrender my comfort. I surrender my opinions, my security, to find common ground with whoever I meet so they might meet Jesus. And this, this priority is what he says the gospel expects from us too. You remember that passage we started with from Colossians? It says, yeah, well, whatever we do, wherever we are, in everything, we do it as a representative of the king, Jesus. This is the expectation all the time, everywhere, in all things, with all people, we would show the world what God is like. And that brings us to number three. Because God so loves the world and wants all the world to know and believe and be saved, Paul says that we need to live this life with purpose and that the gospel defines our purpose. Verse 24 says, don't you realize that in a race everybody runs but only one person gets the prize. Run to win. Run to win. Discipline your body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, before you know it, if you aren't careful, your message might be disqualified by your lifestyle. See, Paul gets it. Paul knows that this life of following Jesus is tough. He's living it and that you can't have it all and you can't always get what you want, but it's so easy for us as human beings to fall back into the mindset that we deserve whatever we want whenever we want it. It's so easy for us to fall back into old patterns thinking it's about me and what I want. And that's why it says at the end of the chapter that we need to stay disciplined, we need to stay focused because it's worth the sacrifice. It's worth the training because Jesus and his kingdom are worth it. You were saved for a reason. You were saved for purpose, to go and show the world what God is like. The gospel has to define our purpose. It has to define where we're going and our race, and we need to be running to win so that in whatever we do or say, we, we do it as a representative of Jesus. And that's chapter nine. Whew, right? Band, come on up. You guys are doing an awesome job today, by the way. That's chapter nine. I don't know how we get stuck, Pastor Joe, I don't know how we get stuck preaching like all of chapters, right? All chapter eight, all chapter nine. I don't know how you guys get stuck listening to me for that long, but listen, I threw a lot at you. There's a lot to what Paul has to say here, but to sum it up, here's what I think Paul is trying to drive home. First and foremost, Paul is trying to say that God loves you. God loves you and believes in you and is calling you into a life that he has set aside for you, one of purpose, one of passion and love, a life of freedom from all the garbage that's been holding you back. God loves you, and he wants to give you a new life of grace and peace as sons and daughters of God. That's the first thing Paul is trying to say. God loves you, and he wants to know you more. And then he goes on to say, for many of us as followers of Jesus, he's saying that 
Above all, the gospel matters most. In this life, and just like last week, everything in us must live and surrender to this love that God has for the world. This is our purpose, and this is why we're still here. If you're wondering, after you get saved, like, why, why didn't you just get beamed right up to heaven? Well, this is why we're here. It's so our lives might be the seeds of faith planted in someone else's story. So our testimony of how God changed us might inspire others to repent and believe. Paul is saying that this life is a race and we need to run to win. Because you were made for greater things. Greater things than you've been doing. So run to win. God wants to use you. Everyone in this room, God wants to use for miracles. But you need to live with his purpose. God wants to do unbelievable things through you beyond anything you could ask or imagine. But before that happens, before that can happen, God is calling you to leave behind the disqualifications. The inconsistencies between what you practice and what you preach. Those things that leave the observing world scratching their head like, yeah, they talk about Jesus but their life isn't backing it up, so why should I believe? And you know what those things are for you because we all have them. We've always had them and we'll have them until we die. But that's why Paul is saying we need to pursue discipline. We need to treat this life like an athlete treats their body, preparing for a race. That we might, that what we might take every step with focus forward leaving the life that we are saved from behind and stepping into that new future. And this is what God has for us. This is what God has for you. And yeah, we just talked about food and we talked about freedoms and we talked about submission and all this. But really, in the end, this is all about God's kingdom. God's love for you and his kingdom coming to earth and making all things new. Taking the mess that we made and cleaning it up so all might know what God is really like. That's what this life is. And this is what he's calling us into, but we have to let the disqualifications go. We're running this race. There's no cheating in the kingdom of God. And so I know that we all have things. We all got stuff that's, that's, that's holding us back, class, that's in our past, and we're like, it's begging for our attention. Chapter eight, it was like this food sacrifice at the temple, right, for the Corinthians. But maybe for you, it's, Maybe for you it's uh, gambling. I don't know. Maybe that's the life that you were saved from and it still begs for your attention. Maybe it's substance abuse. Maybe it's anger or jealousy. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe that's the thing that the enemy keeps pulling on to keep you in place instead of stepping into the life that God saved you for. These disqualifications these inconsistencies that the world notices when we're called to represent Jesus. And so today is a new day to say, I surrender all. Amen? Today is a new day to say, Jesus, all to you I surrender. All to you I freely give. So we're gonna sing this song together, and as we do, I just, I'm gonna be praying that God is impressing on your heart those things those inconsistencies as we say, all to Jesus I surrender, all to thee I freely give. And we're living this life with open hands and we're singing this song with open hands, saying, God, take my past, take my doubt, take my addictions, take my anger, I freely give it. I surrender all of myself to you. I surrender my marriage problems. I surrender my, 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 my lust. I surrender it all because I am stepping into the position that you saved me for as a son and daughter of God. Let's pray. God, we believe that you are doing something today. So God, in this moment, I ask that you would just open our eyes and soften our hearts, God that you would help us take that step of surrender today, that, that, that we wouldn't see that as weakness, God, but we'd see that as strength, 
stepping into the life you have, a better life, a better way. God, we trust you and we receive your message today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.